There have been plenty of bad fake punts over the years. Just a few days ago, I broke down one of the worst ones out there, when Eric Weddle decided that 4th and 35 was a good time to call for a fake. And yes, that was an awful decision. But as bad as it was, there's a few positive things I can say about this play. Number one, Weddle has thrown a football before. Now, he's never thrown a pass in the NFL before that, and the last time he threw a long pass before that play was in 2006 when he was in college, but at least he has an idea of what a quarterback is supposed to do. Number two, it didn't end up mattering in the end. Number three, even though the failure gave the Raiders good field position near midfield, the Raiders still had to drive a bit to get into field goal range. It's not like the Chargers gifted Oakland with automatic points. And perhaps most importantly at number four, everyone was aware that it was a fake punt. As awful as that call was, everyone on the team knew it was a fake punt. He didn't have players who had no idea what was going on. The intended receiver was aware that he was receiving the ball. So just to recap, as bad as that fake punt on 4th and 35 was, it at least involved a guy who had thrown a football before at a considerable distance. It at least resulted in the team winning. It at least didn't give the opposition guaranteed points, and at least it had 11 players who were all on the same page. It's not much, but it's something. Want to see a play where none of those four things exist? Welcome to Dumb Decisions. Now before I break this play down, this whole series is about taking an in-depth look at decisions made during games that were clearly awful from the start. This isn't something that looked bad in hindsight. Rather, this is something that looked awful almost immediately. These are moves where your gut instinct tells you right away that there's no way this can possibly work. And sure enough, your gut instinct was smarter than that of an NFL head coach. And man, do we have an absolute catastrophe for you today. Which takes us to this play, September 18th, 1988, live at the Pontiac Silverdome for a game between the New Orleans Saints and the Detroit Lions. San Diego, after back-to-back -back episodes of this series based off of your blunders, you're off the hook for once. It's a big game for both of these teams early on in the season, with both teams sitting at 1-1 one one after two games. New Orleans is traveling to Detroit in front of a sparse crowd of under 33,000 fans. Some might look at that crowd of 33,000 and say that's a small number. Others might look at what happened on that day and say that's insane that 33,000 people actually paid money to see this display of football. Things were pretty standard in the first half of the game, with the Lions leading 14-7 at the half. Then, Morton Anderson kicked a field goal to make it 14-10. After that, Chuck Long and the Lions offense lined up, but couldn't get anything going. Facing a 3rd and 22, the Lions have the brilliant idea to leave Hall of Fame linebacker Ricky Jackson unblocked. Jackson had four sacks that day. Long sees Jackson, and just decides not to get rid of the ball. This leads to Jackson getting the easiest sack of his life, and the Saints getting two points off of the safety. When the Lions got the ball back in a 14-12 game, they went three and out. And that led to the fake punt that you just saw. So let's start with the logistics behind this. Why on earth would you go for it on your own 12-yard line, up by two points? Why is that a bad idea? Well, for starters, you had the best punter in professional football on your team. You could have flipped the field. In 1987, Arnold, at the age of 26, was named a Pro Bowler and a first team All Pro. He averaged 43.6 yards per punt, which was the second best total in the league. In 1984, as a member of the Kansas City Chiefs, he led the league by averaging 44.9 yards per punt. And the previous week against the Rams, he averaged over 44 yards per punt. Heck, during this game, he averaged over 44 yards per punt. So it's not like this is a bad punter here, or a guy that routinely shanks things. This is a punter that knows what he's doing. I mentioned that Jim Arnold was the NFC's punter in the Pro Bowl last year. That coming after he was actually cut by the Lions, and he came back to have his best year ever. And Arnold 
Gets the butte away. At the 19-yard line, and Gray. But throwing the ball? Yeah, that's not his forte. The last time he ever threw a pass in a game was back in 1981 as a member of Vanderbilt. It fell incomplete. The only pass he's ever completed in an actual game was in 1979, over nine years before this play happened. It went for nine yards. I could find no footage of the play, and considering Vanderbilt went 1 in 10 that season, I'm sure Vanderbilt burned any footage from that season anyways. Arnold is a great punter, but he's never thrown a pass in the NFL before, he hadn't thrown a pass at any level in seven years, and he hadn't completed a pass in nine years. As for who they would have been giving the ball back to if this play backfired, the Saints were coming off of a game on the road against the Atlanta Falcons where they won 29-21. During that game, the Saints had 13 drives. You might be able to notice something in terms of when they scored versus where they started off with the ball. If you gave them bad field position, they weren't able to do anything with it. If you gave them good field position, they capitalized. There was a clean cutoff between drives where they scored and drives where they didn't. Early on that season, New Orleans' offense would shoot itself in the foot with penalties and turnovers, but if you gave them good field position, they would capitalize. And if this fake punt didn't work out, considering the field position they'd get, you're practically giving them 7 points. The Saints were struggling offensively that day. Detroit had a great defense to start the season off. Through two games, they had only allowed 34 points, which was the 4th best total in the NFC. The only three teams that allowed fewer points through two weeks all made the postseason, including the LA Rams, the Minnesota Vikings, and the Chicago Bears. And against New Orleans, Detroit's defense was doing their job. Prior to the fake punt, New Orleans had eight drives. They scored on two of them, and scored a touchdown on just one of them. That's it. Punting the ball away, assuming it was a good punt, would have likely resulted in the Saints being kept off the board, or at worst, being held to three points. Compare that to the alternative of giving the Saints the ball inside your own 12-yard line, and yeah, you can decide which odds you like more. That leads to the important question of why. Why did they call this fake punt? Prepare yourself for what's about to happen, because it is an absolute catastrophe in communication. It starts with a man named Butch Wolfel. He was taken in the first round of the 1982 NFL Draft by the New York Giants, and his career was an interesting one. He was the NFC Offensive Rookie of the Year in 1982, and had over 1,200 yards from scrimmage with the Giants in 1983. But he fell out of favor with Bill Parcells shortly after that, got traded to the Houston Oilers in 1985, and found his way onto the Detroit Lions in 1987. This game against the Saints in 1988 would unknowingly to him be the last game of his career. He injured his knee during the second quarter of this game. Normally, he split out wide on special teams to cover the punt. But because of his injury, he was replaced by Carl Painter. That's Butch Woolfolk. So you take a look at that on in, if we can get an instant replay because that was an ugly looking cut. You can see he cut off his his knee, and it looked as though he might have some knee damage. Hopefully it's just his ankle. I hate to say anything because I've laid on that turf before. It doesn't look as though he's in a lot of pain, but it took a very awkward cut. And you can say that the, the knee definitely looked as though it might have buckled. Finds a hole, and now he's going to try to cut to the outside. Watch this. You see that? Oh, my God. His, his knee took off. He went in a direction that I don't think it should have. I just hope he doesn't have a very serious, serious problem, but you look as though it, it is a knee. Painter was the team's sixth-round pick that year, and he lasted two seasons in the NFL, scoring a grand total of zero touchdowns they would find a much better halfback the following year in the draft. Anyways, Painter was in for Woolfolk on special teams duty. There was just one small problem. Painter had never played this position before. He had never even practiced this position before. Head coach Darrell Rogers just threw him out there, hoping he could learn on the fly. On the field, Arnold saw that Painter was uncovered, so he audible to Mayday. The only problem? Painter didn't know the audible. He didn't know the play. He didn't even hear the call. After the game, Painter said that he was concentrating about one thing only, and that was covering the punt. He didn't know anything about May Day. He genuinely had no idea what was going on, which makes sense, seeing as he's never even practiced the position before. I think writer Jim Taylor summed it up best afterwards 
when he said we've got a punter who had never thrown a pass in an NFL game and a coverage man who had never played the position and knew nothing about a fake kick collaborating on one of the most botched up plays of the season. This was the turning point of the game. Defensive end Eric Williams said that the call took the wind out of our sails. Linebacker Chris Spielman said that the play changed the momentum. And offensive tackle Lomas Brown said that that play was the turning point. Even Saints head coach Jim Mora was baffled post-game about the play, calling it a shocker. Sure enough, the Saints scored a touchdown two plays later, and they won the game 22-14. Who could have possibly seen that coming? So what did we learn from this play? If you're going to call a fake punt, make sure you don't do it at a spot where you give the opposition an almost guaranteed touchdown if it backfires. Don't do it with a player who had gone a decade without throwing a pass. And it's probably a good idea to make sure that everyone knows about the fake punt and that everyone's on the same page. Because when that communication isn't there, you can't exactly be surprised when this play backfires. Talk about a dumb decision. And the Lions decide to go for the pass play, and Paul Painter was there. A fake out of their own end zone, leading by only two points. Well, that was not intended to be a fake, but the quarterback blitzed from the outside. Jim Arnold saw that there wasn't anybody covering the wide receiver, but the wide receiver never even looked back for the ball. Carl Painter's outside your vision here. Arnold sees that they're blitzing from the outside, and he throws it. He's wide open, but he never even looks for the ball.